Good evening, and welcome to our second Authors of Mystery Talk panel. Uh, tonight we'll be talking about characters and how we create them uh, with three authors from the Sisters in Crime Heart of Texas chapter. We have Noreen Cedeno, Kathy Waller, and David Chambrone. And I'm going to read three short bios of the authors, and then we'll let them talk about some of their recent work. Um, Noreen Cedeno is the president of Sisters in Crime Heart of Texas chapter. She's a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin, who writes mystery novels and short stories that are typically set in Texas. Her short story entitled A Reasonable Expectation of Privacy tied for third place for best short story in the 2013 Analog Readers Poll. Her novel, For the Children's Sake, was selected as a finalist for a book award by the East Texas Writers Guild in 2016. Her latest novel, Degrees of Deceit, came out in August 2019, and her latest short story collection, Arson Vibes and Other Tales, came out in April 2020. She is currently working on a paranormal mystery series called Bad Vibes Removal Services while sheltering from the pandemic at her home in Round Rock with her husband, three teenagers, and a German Shepherd mixed dog. Dr. David Chambrone is a retired aerospace and defense company executive, scientist, professor of engineering, and a business and environmental consultant, and is now a best-selling, award-winning author living in Georgetown, Texas, with his wife, Kathy. He has published 22 books, four nonfiction, two textbooks for a California university, and 16 mysteries, and has new mysteries in the works. He is the author of the Virginia Davies Quilt Mysteries. The newest Virginia Davies Quilt Mysteries novel is due out in the fall of 2020. Dave has been a speaker at writers' groups, schools, colleges, libraries, quilt guilds, writers' conferences, and business and scientific conferences internationally. Dr. Chambron also wrote three newspaper columns and wrote a column for a business journal. Dave is a member of Sisters in Crime, the San Gabriel Writers League, the Writers League of Texas, Mystery Writers of America, and the International Thrillers Writers Association. Dave was appointed a U.S. Treasury Commissioner and to the Management Board of the Resolution Trust Corporation by President Clinton. He is a fellow of the International Oceanographic Foundation. Dave has a Bronze Trial Award from the Archaeological Institute of America. He is also a member of the Order of Merlin of the International Brotherhood of Magicians. And we have Kathy Waller, who has published crime fiction, but for her blog, Telling the Truth, mainly she writes personal essays, memoir, humor, parody, and whatever else comes to mind. Much of her work is inspired by her early life in a small, very small town on the banks of the San Marcos River in Central Texas. She's now working on a novel. She lives in Austin with two cats and one husband. Welcome, everyone. So let's start with Noreen. She's on the top of my screen here. And we'll have you um, just give us a little overview of your books and stories. Well, um, I write a lot of short stories. A lot of them are still on my computer. Some of them are published. Uh, I've written four novels. Uh, the first one was called All in Her Head. And it's a, let's see if I can show that. Uh, romantic Suspense. Uh, the second was called For the Children's Sake, and that is a medical mystery. Uh, then I started a series, which is called Bad Vibes Removal Services, and the first book in the series was called The Walls Can Talk, and as you can see, it has ghosts in it. And the latest one in that series is called Degrees of Deceit, and this one just came out last fall, and this is the... Uh, not for resale version, because it's got a light across it, but I didn't have the original the other copy handy. That's um, awesome. Thank you. All right, great. Dave, how about you tell us about um, some of your writing? Well, as you said, I have, a, I have some newspaper columns and stuff. Um, my Most of my books have the main character is a lady, her name is Virginia. She's in most of the books, probably about 12. Um, I have two other series. One is a retired engineer who moved to Texas from California and wrote a Andy Hintz column for ladies. And nobody, the ladies that wrote to him didn't know it was him. That was easy to do because I moved from California here, and I used to write a newspaper column. It was a Andy Hintz column for women. Nobody knew except the editor of the paper that I was Aunt Kay. That's who they were writing to. And the other one has to do with a coroner. 
that book take place in California because I knew how the corners work there, so that was just easy for me to do. Virginia books, and the last five are my book mysteries. Quilt is part of the story. It actually takes place in the story. And when I wrote the first one, I just thought I was going to write the book, and then my publisher called me and said, you're writing quilt mysteries from now on. Simples took off. So now I write quilt mysteries. I've got five of them done and two more. One, one is at the publisher now, and another one is in work. But uh, so I go down to quilt guilds and quilt shows to books the books. Wonderful. Have you ever been to the Pflugerville Quilt uh, Guild? They were um, before COVID yes. pandemic. Yes, they yes. were a very active group here. We loved having their shows here. It was wonderful. Great. Well, Kathy, tell us a little bit about your writing. Well, I am the one who does not have a book of my very own out there. I have several um, short stories and anthologies. The first um, short stories I wrote were in the voice of a, an 11 year old precocious um, girl uh, in Texas, about 1960, a child who uh, knows an awful lot and tells it all. And she told so much that there was one of those stories that I cannot have published because guess whose family they're about. Uh, I have two stories in Murder on Wheels, um, which was put out by Austin Mystery Writers several years ago. And in Lone Star Lawless, another of their publications. And also I have one in Day of the Dark, which was put out just before the eclipse several years ago. And all the stories in here deal with some kind of eclipse. And then the latest uh, publication is one of the bullet books uh, collection that Manning Wolf started. And uh, the book is called and it was written with Manning. And so, you, sorry, so, Kathy, just real quick. Will you repeat the title of that? We had a weird little, like, fun glitch that just took out that okay. title. What was that? The title is Stabbed. Okay. <laughs> Tells you a lot about the book. <laughs> and um, I've got one on the online magazine, Mysterical E. And there are some other bits and pieces. I'm working on a novel now. And so I hope to have something out under my own name someday. Wonderful. Wonderful. Great. So thanks for telling us about um, what you've done. So tonight we're going to be talking about characters um, and how you guys create them, which Kathy doesn't, we don't even need a whole book. You have created characters, I'm sure. And this was a, uh, the question that we started the first panel with um, that we were talking about setting. And based on the answers of those authors, I'm interested to see what your answers are. So um, Kathy, for you, what comes first, uh, characters or the setting? Well, with me, they're really intertwined. I am so grounded in my childhood youth in that very small town, which is about 50 miles southeast of Austin, that um, when I think of a character, it's sort of automatically that is the type of person. Somebody knows something about rural life, small town life, small city, things like that. And um, those are my most successful characters. When I try to write about someone else, someone from another setting, I don't know them nearly as well. And so um, the setting and the, the characters sort of come together. Wonderful. Noreen, how about for you? Is it characters or setting or some combination? It's a combination. It depends on what I'm writing. Uh, if, for the series I'm working on, the uh, Bad Vibes Removal Services, I already have the characters. So then the setting might be the first thing that I start thinking about. Uh, for if I'm writing science fiction, they tend to be interwoven because uh, the world that I create goes with the character. And it's what kind of character is in this kind of world. Um and then for a lot of my stories, I may have the character first and then figure out the setting later because I'll have the plot and the character. And then 
it, 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 the setting isn't as important. It kind of depends on what I'm writing. Yeah. Dave, how about for you? Well, most of the later, especially the quote mysteries, I know who the lead character is. That's Virginia. And sometimes her husband's in it. And then I basically pick out you know, what the story is going to be. That pretty well dictates the initial place where the story is going to take place. And a lot of times the story just, the setting goes with the story. Then I pick out the, her sidekicks. Mm. She comes first, or the lead character comes first. And then I figure out, now that I know the story now, now where's it going to go? Sometimes it's in one location, sometimes it's in multiple locations. She moves around. Especially now, because the Georgetown police said I had to move my character out of Georgetown sometimes because I was killing everybody in Georgetown. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so Dave, moving on to the next question for you, because um, you've kind of touched on this a little bit. What is the relationship, if any, between your own experiences and the characters you create? Uh, me? Yeah. Okay. Um, well... Virginia's husband is an engineering professor, and I did that, so there's a lot of me in Andy. Um, now, uh, Virginia isn't really based on anybody in particular. She's kind of a combination of people that I've known. One of her sidekicks is, a, is based on a woman that I know in California. Uh, she's almost as crazy as Virginia. Uh, and one of the places that I send them places I've been, so I can add only some realism to that. And Andy happens to be an amateur magician, so am I. So that's why Andy and I are a lot alike. But most of the characters uh, are, you know, some of it is based on things that I've done um, with the military, with other agencies of the government that I've worked with. I'll, I'll put bits and pieces of that in there, too. So I'll draw on, reality, on real things as well as the fictional yeah. Kathy, how about for you? Is there any relationship between your own experiences and the characters you've created? Well, in a story I mentioned a few minutes ago, I, uh, I quoted a story told by one of my elderly relatives so um, carefully that that's the one I can't have published. I can't have out of you know, a small group in the family. We have a lot, uh, but it's not anything for public consumption. Things kind of creep in. Cows seem to creep into my stories. Rivers, um, a certain cat that belonged to the neighbor, Steve. Um, it, it's a little embarrassing, though. In, in one story, in Murder on Wheels, I wrote about a teenage girl who is desperate to get out of a small town. And then another story in the same volume, I wrote about a middle-aged librarian who convinces her siblings that they should send their mother to her heavenly rest early because she wants to get her inheritance and spend the rest of her life on the beach in Aruba. And it's a really good idea because the mother is raging around in, in a red Corvette, um, you know, endangering pedestrians. And also she has dinner parties for Harry Truman and Douglas MacArthur, even though they have been dead for decades. So, you know, there is some reason you know, for kind of getting rid of her. But uh, when it was published, this was my first publication you know, between covers and everything. And I handed, I, I gave one to my high school English teacher, and I gave one to all my cousins and my aunt, and I was so pleased. And then I got to thinking about it. I lived in a very small town for a very long time. I was a librarian. I lived with my mother for years and was some uh, for time you know, caregiver. And it seems like maybe I've psychoanalyzed myself and handed it out to the family. <laughs> and uh, yeah. uh, it, most uncomfortable, I really liked my mother <laughs> and I was in no hurry to get out of town. But um, I, I've learned I have to be careful <laughs> how I frame things yes. and whom yes. I give them to. 
Mm-hmm. Noreen, how about for you? Um, what are your experience in character connections? Uh, I have been known to use parts of people. So I, I would never take a whole person that I know and throw them in there, not without their permission anyways. Uh, but sense of humor from this person, or um, I tend to use people with military backgrounds because my, uh, my brother is in the army and uh, he's a career officer and my brother-in-law is in the Navy and is a career officer. So we have that background. So if I tend to throw in characters with military backgrounds because of that. I tend to throw in Hispanic characters because my husband is from Ecuador and my mother-in-law and all of my husband's family are from Ecuador. Um, Sometimes I throw in a real restaurant. Sometimes I throw in um, just places I've been. But um, as for characters, again, not, not any one person, but a lot of things feed into them that are from my life. That's a really good segue into the next question, which I'm actually going to kind of narrow a little bit. Originally, it was how do you draw characters from your own life um, or from history? But we've kind of covered that right now. But um, Kathy mentioned a couple of presidents there and you mentioned the military. So how about from history? Um, have you drawn characters and what pieces of those characters do you draw from history? Me? Yeah, Maureen. Let's okay. Okay. One of my books, I drew a character directly from history. Um, I had read a letter by Robert Louis Stevenson describing the life of Damien of Molokai. So Damien of Molokai was a guy who went to work with the lepers. He was a Catholic priest, and he saw that they were social outcasts with nothing. They were forced to live out of society. They had no proper shelters, no medical care, no schooling, no food for the children, for the people at all. And he volunteered to go live with them to improve their conditions, knowing full well that he would eventually get leprosy himself and die, which he did. So Stevenson traveled through the South Pacific and heard about Damien and went and interviewed a whole bunch of people who knew Damien after Damien died. Um, And he saw that someone from his church had written a letter disparaging Damien. And he published an open letter to that guy uh, drawing out an exact description of who Damien was, all his faults, all his good, uh, his bad characteristics, good characteristics, everything, and then predicted he would be a saint. And he was. He was made a saint. Um, and I read that letter and I thought, okay, what would that look like today? And I took the Damien character and I made him the victim in my medical mystery, where I made him the guy who was ministering to some children who had a genetic disease that caused other people to die when they touched their skin oils. So they were put in quarantine and then my priest in my book is the person who's fighting for their rights and then gets murdered. And his background in the story is modeled off of Damien of Molokai. Wow. That is an awesome resource to have for um, drawing characters from Dave. How about you? Have you drawn any characters from history specifically? Not really. The only thing I drew from history was my first quilt mystery. But the quilt was actually in the book is actually a historic quilt. It actually existed, and I use that because nobody's been able to find it. I use that as the basis of the, the story. But um, no, I kind of leave my historical characters alone. They might come back about me. Yeah, yeah. And Kathy, did the um, presidents come back to haunt you uh, in the stories? How is it drawing from history? Oh well, that sent me a reference. Um, the the librarian's mother. Um, just does that and then complains that they argue at the, at the dinner table. And as I guess Truman MacArthur, but I suppose if you put them together at, the, at dinner, but that's, those are, are just oblique refer- references, not, um, not really characters. Um, so let's segue into kind of how the characters um, are develop through your writing process. Um, so, Kathy, for you, how do characters change between drafts? 
Well, if I'm doing it right, their personalities are fleshed out and they, um, they achieve more depth, I guess. Uh, I, I started with a main character who was uh, known for having an explosive temper when she was a child and throwing tantrums. And so when she goes back to visit, every adult there reminds her what a terrible little child she was. And that's what they do in small towns. They remind you <laughs> of your misspent youth. And um, as I kept writing, I said, no, wait a minute. This is this is rather foolish. There had to be a reason. And so I determined that the reason that she had those little tantrums with, was that she has a cousin, Claudia. And Claudia was always getting her into all kinds of trouble, like saying, um, why don't you touch the electric fence and see if it's on? And, um, you know, that would tend to make somebody pretty upset, you know, especially if you're six years old and you touch the fence. And so that's why she had all those tantrums that people just don't understand. It was Claudia that was causing them. And uh, now she's grown and Claudia is still doing it. And she's still falling in and getting in with, you know, following the leader. But now she has to control that temper uh, and figure out how to work around it. So from draft to draft, that's, that's how she's changed. Nice. Dave, for you, you have a series, so maybe it's not just between drafts, but um, has your character changed between books? Just a little bit. Well, in one case, she moved from California to Texas, as I did. Um, she got married, and, um, and she's gotten a little older. So that's about the changes. She's still a pain in the neck when I'm trying to write her. Uh, but um, that's pretty... As far as changes go, she doesn't change much. She gets into trouble. That's cons that's consistent. Um, but now I try to keep. I, you know, I was afraid of her because she's been my character for a long time. And if I kept her getting older, she'd be almost my age. So um, <clears throat> you know, I can't have that. So especially when you're a dirty old man writing these things, you know. But the uh, she's a. Doesn't change much. Um, Andy just changed jobs. He went from the University of California to University of Texas. Um, she doesn't change much. I try to keep her pretty much as she is, as she gives me gives me hell. Yeah, I'm sure your readers appreciate that. Noreen, how about for you? Um, how do characters change between? I've changed their names. I try to write the. I usually have a vision of the character in my brain, um, but they don't necessarily get on the page in the first draft. Dialogue and plot get on the page in the first draft. Description rarely does. So what they actually look like ends up being in the second draft where I think about it more. Okay, what does this person look like? Because usually I hear their voice first and I, I don't necessarily see all of them. So description gets put in the second draft. And then when I'm done and I look at it and I've got this full character, um, usually I try to choose a name that fits their personality. So um, I go through baby name book. <laughs> I, I've changed a name after finishing the first draft, after finishing the second draft, because the, it just didn't fit the character anymore from when I started it. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, so that does lead um, fairly well into, um, let's see, I skipped one, but I kind of like um, the, what types of information do you know about your character? So Noreen, you were just talking about knowing kind of what they're saying at first and then kind of how they look. Um, are there things about that you find about your characters that you didn't already know? By yes. the end of the process, yes, yes, definitely. Um, yes. Dave and Kathy, would you say the same thing that there you find sure. there are things you don't know about your characters? Yeah. Um, so, um, can you each tell us uh, if you can think of kind of an anecdote of a character who did something in a story that you hadn't planned um, or that you didn't approve of? 
So I'll start with Dave. He's kind of nodding down there. <laughs> what character uh, did? Was it was Virginia. Marie um, knows the story. I had written, a, so I had a scene I was going to put in a book. And Virginia's going to be in it. I knew I was going to write that scene when I started the book. And I finally got to a place I could put it in, and I did. It was about 9 o'clock at night. I finished this. Ah, good. My character, Virginia, says, uh-uh, this doesn't work. We're not going any further. I don't like this. We mean, you know, so I'm sitting at my den arguing with her, right? And my wife walked by and said, who are you talking to? I said, Virginia. She doesn't like this scene in the book. Okay, closes the door. So I'm still fighting with Virginia about 15 minutes later. And she, my wife walks by and said, it's going to be foggy tonight. Fog, you know, I, I'm inside. Then I said, fog? Fog? I rewrote, tore out the draft and rewrote. By midnight, I had a better um, scene than I had before. And Virginia I said, see, that works. So the characters actually argue with me. Especially Virginia, she'll and we we discuss some of the scenes. Now, if there's meds, there are meds for this, but if I took them, I couldn't write. But uh, it's, uh, but yeah, Virginia is kind of a bill. I try to control her, but it doesn't work. Yeah, she gets into trouble on her own. Those are some of the best characters. Kathy, how about for you? Have you had a character that um, did something you hadn't planned or didn't approve of? Well, I had wanted as just a plain vanilla person and then turned emotional and finally murdered someone. And I didn't know she was going. To, and I was very grateful because it helped end the story because I hadn't known what was going to happen. Who was going to do it. Um, I also started with a character one time. Uh, I called her Rue. And she was dead boring. And of course, I attached that to the on the. Um, um, at any rate, the poem with Rue, my heart is laden for golden friends I had, um, which is a very sad poem. Well, I changed her name to Molly, and she started having a lot more fun, and so did I. And uh, you know, just changed the name and. That's awesome. How about for you, Noreen? Is there any um, characters who've done things you had planned or approved of? Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, I scared myself. One of my ghosts scared me while I was writing it. I did not expect him to pop out the way I did. And as I was writing the scene, I scared myself. Um <laughs> I um, I had a character who's uh, she's kind of the, the the friend the best friend in my bad vibes removal services stories. Her name's Kamika. She had her credit card stolen, and I didn't know until I was until it came up that she was fabulous at personal finance, and she already had like all of the locks and things in place to prevent uh, fraud against her credit card, and it was all taken care of in advance, and there weren't wasn't going to be any problem with it because she'd already taken care of that and uh, yeah I, it surprised me as i wrote it but i knew that was her <laughs> she told me that was her that's awesome um so for your characters you guys seem to know so much about them um do you create a vision board or like any sketches i'm personally not artistic i might be a little crafty but can't draw like some of our other wonderful staff but um so kathy for you do you create like a vision board or sketch out any of your characters no it's it's all in my head i i don't i'm yeah. not artistic same noreen for you do you do any like vision board type stuff with your character or have like a character bible even I, I have a directory for my series so that I can keep track of whose eye color is what and how tall people are. Otherwise, I would get it mixed up because um, I've got too many characters now. Uh, other than that, um, as I go through and write about halfway through, um, I, I, I'll stop and I'll make a timeline so I can see the arc of the character through each book and what they're doing and um, make sure that's all there. But 
I don't usually draw them out. Um, sometimes I will make lists uh, about their personality and um, backgrounds. So, Dave, for you, do you, is it similar? No, I have for the main, most of my main characters. I have a dossier on each one of them, like the CIA dossier. I mean, this thing's got their when they were born, where they were born, who their parents were, what the parents did for a living, uh, how old they were, uh, where they went to school, grammar school, high school, college. Uh, were they in the military or not? They were. What was their rank? What did they do? Uh, what did they do for a living? Uh, the description, like Maureen said, uh, what, do they, what kind of clothes they like, uh, what, they're, what they like and dislike. Do they have any hobbies, religion? Are they, um, I break a, a dossier on the main, just the main characters. The minor characters, no. I mean, I just kind of write down, okay, this, this woman's a brunette, this guy's bald, whatever, you know. But, uh, but I do make a story. Sometimes I make a murder board, a white board and an easel in the garage I bring in. And I'll make put that on just to keep my keep me on the same planet as my character sometimes. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and so for some of those characters that may be a little bit different from yourself, um, what do you use in your process to find the voice of that character? Um, Dave, let's start with you. Me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um uh, I'll try to get, you know, what their like I said, if I know their get the idea their background. I know how to make them somewhat, how to make them dress, how to make them talk, and, and hopefully how to make them act. Uh, but it's basically comes from that dossier as to how to make them, how to make them do it. And I've got to make some of them sound different than me. Now, Andy sounds a lot like me, but he's supposed to. But uh, the others, each one has kind of their own voice. I had a problem. And I wrote another series for the series. They had a male protagonist, and they have one of, they both have girlfriends. And I was writing it, and the man that was in my critique group said, "Who's the who's the main character in this book? Him or the girlfriend?" That's what he is. I said, "No, she's taking over." I was used to writing a female lead character. Mm. I had to go back and stop and redo it. So it's sometimes it can get a little iffy, but I try to change. Who the main who the main person is because I got a I got Virginia is she got takes over strong character yeah <laughs> Kathy for you um, if it's a character who's different from yourself what um, kind of things do you do to find the voice of that character I have um, having a tape recorder in my head and um, there were so many people I have known. Um, back, way back, who were so singular and had such voices of their own. And I seemed to be able to get them on the page. I had a neighbor who used to bring his horse to town for me to ride every summer. And um, he would say, God, Dad, Kathy, we need more horses around here. Now, when them communists come and start to take over, they, they may take our course, and we need more horses. And I can hear it, and it just goes on the page. And um, that's the best I can do. It's just I, the tape recorder in my head. Yeah. Noreen, how about for you? Uh, I, I do hear also the character sometimes talking in their voice with specific accents. Um, an Irish character I'll hear with an Irish accent um, and I'll build from there. So a lot of my characters are, are not like me at all because they're, well, I, I write murder mysteries, so I, I don't personally know any murderers. Uh, I look at history. I try to read a lot of nonfiction so I get ideas of different people's lives because, well, if you look at most people, most people, they live in a neighborhood that's basically the same socioeconomic background. They go to a job with people of the same work background and training. And if you want to get beyond that and beyond your own life, then the best place to do is either, best thing to do is either travel or read a lot. And my option right now with 
three kids at home is read a lot. So for one more question for our panel before we do our two truths and a lie, um, let's start with Kathy. Um, this question was an audience question from our first panel that I really liked, and I'd love to hear um, what you would say are some common mistakes for aspiring authors. The first one I'd say is stopping. To do it and throw it away. Thinking, thinking you have to know the end of the story when you begin, because you don't. I found that out. Um, you should sound like the books that you read or read in high school, because uh, professional writers have editors who tell them where they've gone wrong and where to fix. And also thinking there's only one way to write. You take workshops, you read, you take classes. But when the author says this is the only way to do it, you say, no, you just don't believe that part because you have to find your own way. Yeah. Noreen, what would your advice for aspiring authors be? Finish. Finish what you're writing. Don't stop on the first page. There are a lot of people who want to have the perfect first line and the perfect first paragraph and they never get beyond that. And you'll never finish that way. You have to finish the draft because you can't revise a blank page. You have to have the draft done and then you can go back and make things better, but you have to actually finish. Yeah. And Dave, for you, um, what's something you'd like to say to aspiring authors? Uh, uh, research is important and not doing enough research can be is bad. But also, the other thing on research is use, trying to use all the research you found. It become very boring because it's like a, a textbook at that point. Uh, and also, don't use dollar words when a quarter word would do. Don't send, the, don't send your readers to the, the dictionary. And I guess, and um, say not enough description or too much description. You're making a travel log. And I agree with Noreen, too, with what she said, and Kathy. They're both very Wonderful. All right. Well, you've each given me three statements about yourself. Um, and so in the week leading up to when this panel will air, we shared them on our social media. And hopefully folks who are watching um, have a guess. Uh, so I am going to pull share my screen again um, with our Two Truths and a Lie graphic. And then I am going to um, read off the first three. I think, Dave, we're going to start with you. And then we'll ask Nori and Kathy to take a guess as to what they think their um, the statement that's a lie is. So this time I am going to pull up my little so I can see everyone. Um, so here's our two, tr two truths and a lie. Our three statements are David doesn't know how to type. David writes quilts mysteries and has a skeleton to help him. And David gets ideas for stories playing golf. Um, and Kathy, what do you think? I know we kind of know already, but what do you, what well, I, would you, was your thought? I know she, he writes quilt mysteries. I don't know that, I don't know if he plays golf. He writes an awful lot for somebody who doesn't, but I do know it can be done. Um, without knowing how to type. So I'll go with the typing. Okay. And Noreen, how about for you? Uh, the golf. He the doesn't golf. play golf. <laughs> and that is correct. So the lie here is that you get stories from playing golf. But I get that. But Dave, tell us about this skeleton that helps you. He's sitting next to me. Probably, I don't know if you can see him. Can you see him? I just rotated this. Oh, yeah, there he is. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second so we can really... Oh, he's so dressed up. Yeah, he's a whole nice right? little He's sitting there, he's got a scarf. He's, he's, you know, coming into winter. And he's got a Halloween hat on. Normally, he wears a coroner's hat. He's quite good at being dead. Um, yes. Wonderful. That's great. Okay, so I'm going to go back to sharing again. And so next, I have Noreen. So Noreen loves starting new stories, so their first chapters are the easiest to write. Noreen gets story and character ideas from reading history and enjoys military and NASA history. 
And Noreen usually doesn't know who committed the crime until she's written three quarters of the book. Dave, which one do you think is the lie there? The first one. Noreen loves start writing new stories, so the first chapter is the easiest. First chapter is the easiest. Kathy, how about you? Which one do you think is the lie there? I agree that the first chapters are the easiest to write. Yeah, this one with um, other authors might be a pretty, you, you kind of know that one deep down. So, yes, um, they do, the first chapters are, I'm guessing, not the easiest to write, Noreen? No, no, they're absolutely the hardest for me. And I frequently end up throwing them out after I finish the draft or changing them into flashbacks or moving them to other places in the story. I almost never start a story in the right place. It's one of my problems. <laughs> That's all. It doesn't sound like a problem. That's a great truth to have. Oh, so, so Kathy, we've got Kathy owns a copy of every one of Agatha Christie's mysteries. Kathy wrote a song that explains in detail two sections of the Texas probate code. And Kathy Lee is currently learning to use Scrivener, a word processing program that helps writers organize all aspects of their work. Uh, Noreen, which one do you think is the lie there? Oh my goodness. Um, that's a really hard one. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Kathy, if you wrote a song that explains in detail two sections of the probate code, I'm going to be really impressed. So I'm going to go with that. Yeah. Dave, which one do you think might be the lie? I was looking at these two and I agree. Yeah. You think it might be the song with the probate code? Yeah. Uh, it's not. Kathy does not own every copy of Agatha Christie's <laughs> Mysteries. <laughs> so Kathy, <laughs> where did the song come from? Yeah. Well, I was in paralegal school and uh, test and um, just decided that maybe I could write a mnemonic that I could sort of sing in my head during the test and explain uh, when you die in Texas without leaving a will. And um, the only problem is it, uh, it's to the tune of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And, but it's so long that it was easier just to memorize the code. <laughs> However, it's the thing I'm most proudest of. <laughs> I'm proud of. And uh, it's on my blog. And it was absolutely correct in 2000. Three, but there is no more probate. I found out the other day the legislature has turned it into an estate code. So I have my blog. Oh no! Well, we'll um, when we air this, we should put that uh, link to it in the comments um, <laughs> so that folks can go and look at that. That's awesome! I bet you knew that back and forward after making that. Um, song for it. That was an excellent study resource, I'm sure. Um, so to close us out tonight, I first want to say thank you to you all. Um, thank you, Noreen, to the group for um, being willing to partner with Pflugerville Library and put these panels out. It has been very entertaining and I'm loving talking with you guys. Um, we'll have one more panel in the month of October where our authors will talk about writing humor in mystery. So keep a lookout for that. And if uh, somebody didn't watch the first panel. It is available on the library YouTube channel and um, on our Facebook page on the videos. And so we'll close out tonight. We'll have you each tell us about kind of what you're working on next. Um, Dave, let's start with you. What's your next project? Oh, it's one that's in work now. Uh, I don't remember what the heck we're doing. Oh, yeah. She's... Uh, she said she got a Virginia got a quilt and a logbook. It's by for a French ship, and there was some treasure on it. So we got her museum in the Smithsonian to quickly fund it, which they surprised her. And she's off. She gets attacked by pirates, and it goes. It goes. It goes on. She finally gets through everything. Got about the skin of her teeth, and now she's getting ready to have another problem up in New, New England trying to solve this mystery. Wonderful. And um, Noreen, what have you got working on? Well, the, the pandemic kind of messed with my novel writing. So I have been doing short stories and I'm trying to make myself write at least a short story a month and submit them to various places. Um, I'm also working on more Bad Vibes Removal Services short stories so I can do another collection of those. 
um, I wrote a novella too that I'm editing right now. <laughs> Wonderful. Lots to look forward to, to from you. Thank you. Kathy, what have you got um, working on these days? I'm working on, a, I guess, an amateur sleuth mystery uh, in which a character um, moves back to her old hometown, which has sort of fallen apart because of urbanization and is trying to revive it so it won't turn into a line of strip malls along the riverbank. Thank you very much. Thank you very That's much. So much. You're welcome. Have a great night, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.